aligning technology and big data for efficiency. Rituraj, Rituraj Saha is the head of supply chain at Bonard Record India. Abhishek Kumar, demand and supply planning at Kohler. Sahil Verma, head of demand planning at Dabur. Sahil is a moderator for a change. Now, one interesting thing that comes to my mind is that probably when you look at, you know, a slide like what Dr. Singh showed, the blue slide, if you remember from his presentation, where everything looks very rosy and fancy and, you know, you're using bots, you're using AGVs, and you're using all sorts of technological implementations to further your cause. You actually tend to ponder, is it contemporary? Are we doing it somewhere? Is it actually possible? Is it relevant in my current scenario? What is the depth of implementation? How relevant it is? And what are the pertinent examples? I'll share a very small story. About 100 kilometers from this place, in the heart hinterland of Haryana, in a place called Rotak, there's sitting a manufacturing, a paint manufacturing facility, which is completely automated. Asian paints, paint, Rotak plant. Yes, rightly guess so. If I have to give you a glimpse of, you know, and just again taking cue from what Dr. Singh had showed, it starts from the point where the raw material comes in and further on everything is automated. I am again referring to the, to the subject of the panel discussion here, sensors and solutions. Automation or industry 4.0 as we call it, has served the purpose of bringing down the cost per ton by about 40% in that manufacturing facility. And it's a huge about 3 to 4 lakh kiloliter paint manufacturing facility. Another good example would be, a lot of companies, including Dabur, are now using optimization tools, which again, as you would understand, would take in host of data from different sources. We have distributor management systems, we have ERPs, because we have to reach to the rural hinterland. We have SFA devices, you know, all of those data coming into our servers. And then, at the planning level, we're trying to make sense of it. Not just sense of it, but basis that sense and where my demand actually lies, trying to optimize my secondary, primary, and warehousing cost, which is known by the concept of total delivered cost, which we try to minimize these days. So on that note, putting the point here that it's pretty much relevant and it's pretty much contemporary, and now I would want to open this to my panelists, to my fellow panelists. I mean, I'm the moderator. I cannot call them fellow panelists, but yes. Your thoughts, Rituraj, on what are the applications in your company, which, which are the areas where you're exploring technology and where it is helping to, you know, bring about efficiencies and so. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> so before I talk about how we are leveraging technology to drive efficiency in supply chain. Let me just give you a brief context about the uh, alcohol beverage industry. So, so we operate in a very challenging and uh, regulatory environment. You know, uh, alcohol beverage industry, liquor being a state subject, is subjected to uh, myriad taxes and differentiation in tax levies. You have got different route to market uh, for different markets. Some markets are corporation based, some are wholesale based, and some are, you know, direct markets. Now there is a price, price, there is a pricing control and licensing restriction. At every step of supply chain, we have to seek permission from excise, be it augmentation of warehouse space or movement of stock from point A to point B. Uh, even routes are also mandated by excise or, or increase in license cap uh, capacity. Uh, and on top of that, uh, you know, our demand is very volatile because of uh, weak force, uh, sales skew nature of the business. A lot of people talked about you know, stick sales pattern. Uh, and uh, since it's a uh, you know, state subject, we have a distributed manufacturing setup. So we operate in a complex uh, multi-plant supply network comprising 30 plants getting to requirement of around 34 markets and 1,000 plus uh, uh, trade partners. Uh, so given these challenges, uh, it is imperative that uh, we make our supply chain demand driven and agile. So we are able to cater to any changes in the market need at optimal cost and inventory. 
So let me just talk about how we are leveraging technology to address some of the challenges that we are facing in liquor industry and how we are making our operation more agile and driven, driven to stay ahead of the curve. So there's one technology that we have introduced uh, called Logistics Control Tower, uh, which is about uh, you know, uh, live tracking of uh, outbound trucks. And we are using, actually, we are the one who have actually pioneered SIM-based tracking in alcohol beverage industry. Now, it is helping us in achieving four objectives. Number one, enhanced customer service, because now through Logistics Control Tower, we are sending out advanced shipping notification to our customers. Now, customers are aware when, are going to, when they are going to get uh, you know, their uh, stock. Uh, even sales team is aware, so, uh, so it is helping them plan their you know, operations accordingly. Number two, uh, in many states, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of a license to operate because we have been asked to follow track and trace. So if you don't track our vehicles, we will not be allowed to operate there. So it's licensed to operate in many states. Number three, uh, uh, it is helping us in mitigate risk arising out of theft or hijacking. Uh, just give, to give you one statistics, uh, last year when election was held in 20, 2014, 14 trucks were hijacked. 14 liquor trucks, uh, Parno liquor trucks were hijacked. Okay, no election time, you know, <laughs> you need liquor. <laughs> in 2019, when election was held and we had, uh, you know, track and trace of vehicles, you know how many vehicles were hijacked? What? Well, we could not avoid that. Yes. But we have been able to reduce the number of hijacking from 14 to 1. Okay? And the last one is, uh, uh, now that we have got uh, a lot of transaction data through <coughs> logistics control data, we are able to analyze those transaction data and drive efficiency. So it is helping us in driving efficiency in our operation. In many markets, we have been able to reduce detention because uh, when we do discussion with trade partner, with sales team, we are doing fact-based discussion. Okay? So through fact-based discussion, through analytics, you know, we are able to drive efficiency in our operation. So this is how you know, a logistics control tower is helping us in achieving you know, efficiency and effectiveness in our operation. Uh, now, as far as uh, you know, demand and supply planning process is concerned, since we operate in a multi-plan, uh, you know, complex supply network, it's a very important that uh, we, uh, you know, we have a tool in place to manage complexity that we have in our supply network. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, rolling out uh, integrated supply chain solution uh, that would help us, uh, you know, uh, not only capture demand and, uh, you know, uh, react to that demand in a real, real time basis. It would also help us optimize plans across all plants. Okay, and uh, in a situation, you know, in an environment where your demand is very volatile, you have to manage a lot of exceptions. You know, it has to be exception-based management. So this tool would also help us in managing exception through a what-if uh, scenario uh, capability. Uh, so we are in the process of rolling out uh, integrated supply chain solution that would help us drive a connected supply chain. Okay. So that's the second initiative that uh, uh, we have taken in our organization. Third one is about uh, uh, the initiative that we have taken that the upstream of supply chain. Uh, we import a lot of uh, premium whiskey and vodka from uh, around 13 countries. Uh, we bring them into our warehouses and then from there we distribute uh, you know, stock to our trade partners. Again, uh, the challenges are that we, lead time is very high. Time to market is also uh, high because uh, we have different route to market model for different uh, markets. And uh, because of high lead time, we are also, uh, you know, uh, we keep very high level of inventory for imported stock. So we have implemented, implemented a system called Connect uh, that helps us in giving, uh, you know, visibility of entire operation right from placement of order to processing of order to shipment of stock from brand companies to India, live tracking of shipment all the way to till delivery into our warehouses. And uh, we are able to, uh, you know, drive a collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment process through this tool because it's all about visibility of information, having access to information in a near real-time basis. So, a, we have been able to reduce our time to market. B, we have been we have been able to maintain a higher level of service level at 20% reduction in inventory ever since we have implemented this uh, uh, technology. Uh, I think uh, all of us have spoken about, you know, artificial intelligence, intelligence chatbot, etc. I always wonder how do we bring it to live in our real life, you know, operation. 
So uh, when it comes to reporting access of data, though we have not implemented it, we are in the process of, you know, uh, we, are in, uh, we are at a discussion set at this point in time. We are talking about chatbot you know, for access of information uh, in a near real time basis. You know? So earlier we used to get report through mails. Uh, from there, we graduated to business analytics too, like ClickSense and TopLine for access of reports information. Yeah. Now we have to take our uh, you know, uh, operation point. to next level by using chatbot. Okay? You are in a market, you just ask uh, how much stock I'm carrying for, say, what price tag in, say, some particular depot, you get that information. Okay? So that would really help us uh, you know, uh, reduce effort and time taken to access information, thereby make ourselves more efficient as we go forward. So these are ways by which you can you know, address uh, challenges that you're facing in you know, industry. Okay, so you have your own version of Siri helping you with your corporate work, right? That, that's, that sounds great. What would you know? So um, just to set a context about the kind of industry or the kind of supply chain which we have in Kohler. So the challenge, for example, this discussion also has sensors, plus it talks about big data. So what is big data? From my definition perspective, I would say what goes beyond your 1 million rows and 16,000 columns and maybe uh, 16 million cells. So once uh, now, how do you arrive at that? For example, the kind of range of SKUs which the Kohler world has, so it is close to 30,000 SKUs which you can order for your bathroom from all across the globe. You, you visit a country, you like something, you can order. At the same time, sourcing it from 40 different sites pan globally. Now, in the morning, Mr. Singh talked about uh, uh, how a project site orders can get delivered or can get uh, delayed because of certain reasons. Now, merging this variability, so 1,000 plus site locations where you need to deliver those products, 50% getting imported, 50% source locally, to the expectation of to our delivery. So that is not happening actually, but at the same time we are giving allocation maybe within 90% of the time within 24 hours. So the challenges are how do we use the existing data to churn out what we want? For example, the expectation is okay, but uh, I need, uh, so someone in the morning I was talking about uh, 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 this kind of problem for projects availability can be solved by PERT, CPM, or scheduling kind of modeling. But at the same time, once you are dealing with 30,000 SQs with variety of project sites, how would you ensure that, okay, this particular site, that with, it goes with the assumption that uh, the information coming to me is exactly true, that, okay, this guy would pick up next week, he's telling, so I will choke up my entire warehouse with bathtubs only, with a project site which, is, uh, which was about to come as per schedule next month, but it has got delayed by six more weeks. Now you need to keep that inventory in your warehouse. So the sheer variety of, so there we have started to bank upon data only. Now there are solutions available. Uh, so first of all, to implement any solution, you need to comprehend the problem. What is the problem which we are trying to address is that, okay, I need to have that inventory in place, but when, how, and at what time I need to have at my RDCs to service to the project customer. So, we are, so there is a particular lead time which we need to have for, for that particular, so there is a demand history, for example, the Lodas of the world or the Prestige, they have a demand history with particular sites that, okay, so for example, the concealed part has been picked up. After that, there is a certain lead time attached to when the next thing would happen. It, so the sales guy would, on a project to project basis, would give you certain expectation, but there is a data available to churn out that. Now we have been able to delve into that data with the help of going beyond the Excel sheets with the help of Azure ML, I would say. So it, it is in the evolution phase. For example, first to implement any solution, because a lot of solutions which we see are implemented. For example, everyone talked about APO being there, IBP coming up. So there are instances where you can go to someone and, OK, what is your reference? But at the same time, once you have to look at something new, you have to comprehend what is going to happen. At the same time, what do you want out as an output? It is a black box. So there we have been able to track or on a project site level what has been the pickup. As a result of which in the morning, as we told about the major challenge for transportation warehousing is I, it is very easy. Average plus two sigma, I will choke up my 
everything because the variability for project business is very high. Some particular SQ getting picked up in a particular month versus not getting picked up in the next month because it has a project specific demand. So this kind of problem we have been able to solve with the help of uh, Azure ML with certain SQs. Now we are trying to evolve the same thing into different areas. So, uh, when you talked about forecasting, it talks about getting data from different sources. First of all, I need to understand my data itself which is there in my ERP systems, but I have not been able to see the dependency of, of the same thing on each other. So there we have been able to use it. Right. So very interesting point put up on the black box uh, point. So Girish, I'd, I'd have two special questions for you. You do a lot of consulting work. One is, how do you actually bridge the gap from concept stage to implementation stage for a lot of these organizations who actually want to take that journey? Second, a lot of reservations around, you know, the data coming out to be black box. You being from that background and, you know, ISCM being involved in that, how do you actually uh, help with that uh, impediment? Yes. Uh, let, me, let me start uh, by saying uh, the first thing that we need to address is, uh, to use a turn of phrase, does my supply chain need blockchain? So when, when we look at technology and, uh, you know, uh, what technology can suit a particular application, so something called as an appropriate technology. In fact, Vijay did talk about, do I need an RFID uh, device on my uh, footwear, which I am selling at probably every rupee makes a difference there in terms of your attractiveness to the customer an appropriate technology which I need to do. And the bigger point that when it comes to these kind of technologies is, uh, as an organization, uh, we advocate very strongly that you start small. You know, when a new technology comes in, we are not, and, and especially when we talk about a uh, machine learning kind of technology where, uh, though the technology been, has been around for around 30, for 30 years, 40 years now, machine uh, artificial intelligence is not new. It's been an old technology, it's been there. Its application in this part of the world is new. The problems are less to do with technology like artificial intelligence and more to do with behavior. So what we are looking at is essentially understand the behavior of the organization and nudge the behavior towards use of the technology. And what we have, and it's, it's common knowledge by now that the early proof of concept, if it is positive, creates a receptivity to further investments in technology. Uh, however, what we find is that Technology is being used for the sake of technology. You know, question is, do I need a sledgehammer to kill a fly? Can I use, a, for example, uh, when we talk about uh, data, uh, 16 million rows, 80 columns, is not big data. Uh, I remember way back in 1994, uh, I was given four terabytes of data uh, by a bank and said, uh, very interesting what they told me. We know everything that is there to know in this. Tell us what we don't know. There is nothing more that they are going to tell you. Just one line, he called 14 of us and said, we know everything that we want to know from this data. Tell us what we don't know. And this is where use of that data becomes important. Our approach to data has been that I have a hypothesis, Dr. Singh also referred to it, I want to prove or disprove a hypothesis. Where we need to go across and where we keep advocating is that don't go with that kind of a framework. Say that there is this data, the data has relationship between them, how do I explore those relationships and let those relationships come back to me, which essentially means I'm looking at pattern recognition, and it can be done with simple pattern recognition software, uh, which can throw out those patterns to me. Then it is up to me and my business judgment to say whether those patterns hold or don't hold. Because when you talk statistics, we all know there are lies, 
damn lies and then statistics. Uh, you have spurious correlations which come up. Therefore, when we look at data and when we look at solutions, we first ask them, understand whether what the solution or the pattern suggested makes business sense. Quite, it, in some cases, it might not make sense. In some cases, it will make sense. That differentiation still is with us. Uh, probably when we go to the next level of machine learning, which is essentially deep learning, where we can get into a prescriptive mode. But the current level at which we are looking at technology, we would like to look at it in terms of saying that you are still a part of that process. It is your intelligence which will now look at it and say, is this applicable to me or is this a spurious correlation which I need to ignore? So that's one aspect that we look at it. And what we also want to bring out is that make that investment in the technology. Need not necessarily be a blockchain. Okay, that's the most hyped about technology. It's around seven years from now that it's, it's at the height of its hype cycle. It has to fall come down to the disappointment level where all of us will get disappointed with blockchain and then probably we'll find the level where we'll find the technology appropriate. My suggestion to all people who want to look at technology is that your business is not technology. Your business is manufacturing something and delivering it. What you need to look at is not the latest technology. What you need to look at is a technology that works without bugs. You cannot afford a bug in a technology and that bug affecting your delivery. So you need something which is proven. Use what is proven, leave the experimentation to those people who have the appetite and the risk appetite to go to bet their business on those risky events. Be safe, use a proven technology, master the technology and then go to the next. Technology will keep evolving. I am not sure in seven years time what will be the state of blockchain. What will be the state of evolution of blockchain? Will it exist? Seven years is too long a time for a technology play to make a forecast. If we say that we focus on our business and only take those elements of technology which are proven and implemented, we will have a lot more comfort coming in in technology. People will then say what we recommend works and therefore we, they can bet on what we are saying. That would be my take on it. So start slow, but start firm. I think that makes perfect sense. I'll, I'll share a very small story. When we were doing our supply chain transformation project, I remember we did a two months extensive lipstick study. And then we actually came down to what are those elements, what are those areas or work streams where we actually want to make an impact. When we'll start, we'll have a plethora of areas probably where we have to choose from. And then as you move forward, you'll probably select top five, six work streams where we, you would want to leave the maximum impact. So on that note, and again, a very interesting point put by uh, Girish on choosing established technologies. While technologies can be established, what I ponder upon is there are a lot of players offering the same technology in different zones. So my question again to Rituraj, just since you evaluated and implemented a lot of these, what are the typical tenets of evaluation that go into you know, getting a certain partner onboarded? And how do you go about that process? That's a very critical process. OK. <coughs> yeah, I think uh, the relevance of technology to our process is very important. So I would first say that the process has to precede technology. Okay, for example, when we went about uh, you know, rolling out integrated supply chain solution, we had a relook re -look at our processes. Okay, because if you have a, a suboptimal process and you're trying to automate that process through technology, it won't help. Okay, technology is just an enabler. So I think we have to uh, lay emphasis on revisiting and putting together a process that is that would serve the objective of the organization, a process that meets end objective of uh, your strategy. Okay, so first and foremost, you have to revisit the process if if required, you know, you know redesign a process before you attempt to automate it uh, through technology. That is number one. Secondly, I would say that you know, uh, when it comes to adoption of you know, when it comes to you know adoption of technology, 
you know, it's very important that, uh, you know, acceptability of technology by users is high. You can have very, you know, hi-fi technology, you know, you can uh, roll it out, but if acceptance is not lo low, you know, at the end of the day, it will go down the drain. So I would rather go for a kind of a suboptimal or, you know, average technology with high level of execution than a very, you know, a hi-fi technology with low level of execution. So uh, it's very important that we have lying users on the uh, technology. So I would say dashboarding is very important. Flexibility is very important. We live in a VUCA world. And, uh, you know, don't expect our processes uh, and situation to be stable. You know, your technology has to be robust enough to address all kind of challenges that might arise in a real life world. So it has to be a robust technology. It cannot be, we cannot be, you know, configuring technology based on an ideal process. The ideal process never work in real life world. So these are some of the aspects that you need to uh, take into consideration while choosing a technology. Any, any inputs on the preceding steps? And probably I would also want to, you know, put this question to the audience because a lot of you would be evaluating a lot of tools and softwares and platforms. What are the typical challenges that you, what are the, those typical uh, roadblocks that you see or, you know, questions that come to your mind? For example, if a particular tool is coming in, whether it's been implemented in a similar industry in India, because Indian context is very important to us. Uh, so, can, can I take a shot? Yeah, I have a yeah. couple of spins on this. Uh, how do I choose a vendor? It's a very important question, right? My spin on this is this. If it is of strategic importance, if it is on which I'm going to run my business, use an established player. If you want an ERP, don't go for an experimental guy. Because you can't afford any downtime on that system. And you need serviceability of the system. So essentially, if it is, service, if it is a core to your business, use an established player. If it is on the bimodal strategy, you have an innovative approach, experiment. There, choose the guy who is going to give you that experimentation because a lot of technology is going to be flashed in the pan. It's going to be three years, four years, and then it will going to change. If a technology is going to be for three years, then you can experiment with your vendor. If you are looking at a longer range, you need someone who is a lot more stable and who can be a partner with you for the longer term. So one aspect of, look, of choosing technology is essentially what I would like to put it as, if it is core to your business, stick to a known devil. If it is innovation that you want to look at, because a lot of innovation comes from these smaller players. We cannot rule them out. We cannot say that we will not look at them. They will help you in your innovations. They will help you to come up with it, you will then see you will transit. Once those innovative technology becomes mainstream, you will see the larger players coming up. So you also will need to keep this bimodal strategy of having a set of small players with whom you will innovate and a set of established players with whom you will have a longer relationship. That's my take on uh, so, uh, Anurag, one, sorry, Abhishek, very sorry. One question to you. Uh, you talked about implementation of Azure ML, right? So, now an interesting point here is we talk about choosing a certain vendor, but there's a lot of homework that goes about in the organization as well, right? We also have to set our house in place before we actually go about implementing such things. So, if you could throw some light on what are the things that you had to do, what were the challenges, what were the, you know, various areas where you had to work on before getting that house in order? So I won't say the house is still in order. <laughs> so because itself, we are trying to develop it. So in the morning, someone talked about, OK, is there innovation in place in supply chain? What is the first step to innovation? Someone answered, OK, we need to fail. So that is how I would say that has been our journey. For example, we failed. You talked about hypothesis, and there is a null hypothesis, and there is an alternate hypothesis. For example, Initially, you need to start with something. Of course, there would be larger players in the market who would come up. For example, I would take example of uh, someone talked about Tableau. Microsoft has come up with Power BI, which is free for everyone, I would say, who's having Office 365. But I have hardly seen in the organization where I've worked is people are still going for, because it is a, now the problem is, now Tableau when it started versus Microsoft was a, niche player, I would say, in that particular domain. Now, when Microsoft realized that, OK, we have an option available, I can iterate on that technology and build something like Power BI, which is in-house. It will integrate everything to everything. 
versus a tableau or for, for say click sense. So those kind of now the journey starts from uh, for example while assessing different IT vendors when we used to when I used to buy for ta Tata Motors for different that time you are right the smaller players will come up and give me the nuggets of wisdom the most versus established player because they will say this is what is coming up versus what is available so once you pick up those nuggets you can talk to bigger players okay are you coming up with something like this what is your roadmap for example you have bigger players in different domains which are coming up with different technologies now specifically talking about azure ml it would uh, for example you start with a problem. You have a problem that, okay, huge amount of data, there is no reliability on the data which is coming from the front. Then you have to rely on your own data and take decisions. There, the adaption, adoption part will come into picture that you start small, then complete that hypothesis. Okay, this is turning out to be right. Then the next step. So it's an iterative process which will follow for any new technology. Now, taking a cue from what uh, uh, one of the panelists said that, okay, should I adopt something and, and go for established thing and then implement? My take on that would be, if you are part of the curve, you know what is happening. So for example, okay, I'll sit down and say after three years, something is established, I will adopt it. Then it is an established thing. But you have been trying, failing, trying, failing. Then you know what is right. Otherwise, you will go and adopt something which is everyone is adopted. Then you are not in front of the curve rather than you are lagging the curve. Rituraj, any points from you? How, what were the things that you had to do before you know, putting your CPFR in place? Some of the things which you had to do as a pre-work? Yeah, so <coughs> any other of the yeah, Apart from uh, the process aspect that I've talked about, I think it's also important to understand uh, you know, uh, what kind of support a vendor is going to provide uh, pre and post implementation. That is also equally important. You know, I've done interaction with a lot of players who are very good in technology. They have very, very good solution to offer, but they don't have office in India. You know? <laughs> so, and, and so it's very important that you understand, you know, because it's about, you know, uh, you know full, uh, understanding how you're going to implement it throughout the life cycle of uh, implementation and uh, the support aspect is very important. You need to have guys who have deep understanding of uh, process, a deep understanding of uh, you know, functionality and who can also understand pain points of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, yours and try and configure uh, you know, uh, a tool in such a manner that all those pain points and uh, issues are addressed uh, through a tool. So it's about fitment of process to a tool and having a good uh, pre and post implementation support from vendor. That's also equally important. So just take, can, I, sure. can I add one interesting, uh, it, I take it from what Ashish talks about. First mover advantage in technology. Uh, I have a question. All of us use Word. Yeah? yeah? All of us use Word. How many functions are there in Word? Any idea? Close to 450. 3,000. No, Excel. Oh, no. Word, 3,000. How many of us use 3,000 functions that are available in Word? We don't. No. We don't even know they exist. Yes, absolutely. So what is more important for us? To use the technology we have to the max. We all run ERPs. Are we sure everything we that we can to maximize the usage of the ERP? Or are we still using it at the base? So the problem with technology is not that the existing technology can't give us. The problem is that we don't learn how to use technology well. And therefore, even if you come last to the table, you are the last, for example, Geo. Geo was the last entrant in telecom. telecom. Where is the first entrant? First mover has got nothing to do with business advantage. Most of the times. First mover gets glamour. The person who can master technology and come out with the right technology at the right price point can kill the first mover if he is intelligent enough. And that is what we need to look at when we look at technology. 
not that you know I need the best technology I need to use technology best if you can use technology better than your rival I think you have it made irrespective of the cost at which you have bought it it might be a cheaper solution you have used it better you have the advantage that is one mindset change that we need to make so how uh, should I add on to yeah, that? Yeah, please. So uh, I, when I joined automobile, one of the common phrases which was given is, if a horse and cart were used to the optimal level, maybe we did not have cars. For example, uh, there was a problem that, OK, uh, we ca can we enhance the capacity of, of this kind of a situation versus something, a car? So if we had that kind of situation, so we did not have cars. So someone tried it out. Of course, who implemented better, of course, will win. That is how. For example, when iPhone came, a lot of people talked about, OK, it's a revolution. But of course, there were touch devices before that. So implementation part is as important as, but to, part of, to become part of that learning curve is what I feel is also important. How important is team capability? How important is, I'm just putting this question to everyone, maybe the panelists and the audience as well. How, yeah, how important is team capability? Yes. So what typically would you recommend to be done in order to, uh, probably Girish, we'll solicit views from you also on that. What should be done to actually, that's a very important element. What should be done to bring it at par? Because, for example, data science or big data, that's an area which is very different from what a lot of us have been traditionally doing. It requires undergoing a certain level of understanding of the concepts and training and stuff. How do you go about it? How do you suggest we go about it? So about team capability, right? Yes. Building team capability. First of all, it starts from recruitment. Get the right guys in. And L&D as well. Just take that along. Right? So, yeah. Yes. So it starts a recruitment. Yeah, yeah. But you also have people who already are with you. You need to take care of those people as well. The way we are in the industry today, although we have come a long way, we have people who are not even good at Excel. So you need to bring these guys at par. Team leaders need to take some initiative. Organizations need to take an initiative. It depends more on team leaders. It's a very personal kind of thing. You can take it up as a leader. You make sure that your team delivers. So first of all, realizing that your team delivers, if your team delivers efficiently, half your job or most of your job is done. I'm sitting here because my team is taking care of my job. I don't need, I've not got a single mail since morning. So scale development is a very important part. HR would start it, but as team leaders, you need to focus on that. Now this involves a cost. And I also want to go back to the previous discussion, if you allow me a minute. How do you uh, choose a tool? Luckily, as on date, there's enough open source and there's YouTube to evaluate tools. But I'm not sure what exactly uh, vendors are doing to improve awareness. I'm sure there's some sort of an educational push, but maybe at times it's not enough. So whenever you go in for a new solution, there will be certain blind spots which is what Girish covered, that you need to go for a tried and tested solution. And Ritraj also mentioned that you take a solution which works rather than going to a solution which doesn't work. Now coming back, once you have a solution, you also have, a, have the responsibility to stretch, to adapt. There's always a learning curve. Initially, I mean, I'm a fan of going home at six, but initially, if you need to come at par with standards, you need to push. You need to start using a technology. Personally, I've not had much of an exposure to SAP, right? But I need to build that capability so that if I have the ERP at hand, I know the, uh, the capabilities of the ERP, I can bring up my team to the same level to contribute at that level. So there has to be a conscious push for each point to use technologies which are openly available, let's, let's say open source, or if you're using Word and Excel, you use those to an optimal level. Not everything is done on an ERP. But again, if you have an ERP, you make sure that you push for an internal training program. And there's a lot of, and what you can also do is, even if you don't want to spend money, you assign your team three hours on, on a Friday, the last three hours, which is the close of business, and you tell them that, or maybe in the middle of the week when you're lighter, give them leads, give them links, put them onto YouTube, and tell them to bring something new to you. You don't have to invest into this. It's all about you know, nurturing an environment of learning. That's my take on that. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, please. We'll come to you after this. Yeah. What I understand here, in, from my point of view, uh, 
Why? Either, suppose in company people are asking for 3PL and hiring uh, outside uh, people for their job or whatever, are following, adopting the technology. Your personal involvement, your team involvement must require. You know better the business, your vendor, whosoever, whether whatever expertise they have, but they will not understand your business. You have to get involved. They will not bring the magic. They will not bring the Adugi Chari ki. He will come and solve all the problems. So at any point of time, either we are hiring a vendor for a particular job. You have to get proper involved and you, they will get success only after in your involvement. Suppose technology. But it is not customized according to your business need. So whatever, any circumstances, your personal, your team involvement is must require if you get success in your supply chain business. That is the very important. Can we take him first? Yeah, in that order. Sure, then please go ahead. For, uh, as for me, it's more important that, first of all, right selection of a team. If we don't have a right people in a place, we don't think that it's a right and we can implement the right way. So the first important is the right people and that depends upon the zeal of that person. If somebody is not interested to do that task, that does not mean that we need to push them and then ask him to do that. No. The most important that the person interest of doing that. If somebody is interested in doing some SAP uh, sort of job, yes, they want to be a part of the SAP implementation team, definitely we should consider the, that person and be that person is a part of that implementation team because his zeal and his interest towards doing a SAP implementation would be higher and he will do a better job into that. And talking about the, the um, uh, previous point about the vendor selection, it's, I think it's more important that the cost of the two supplier, two vendors. If, for example, if, you are, if a company is implementing SAP and they have a different vendors like Cap Gemini, Accenture, TCS, all of these three companies, are, all of these companies are better and they, they are supplying and they are the best in their classes. But most important, how much they cost to the organization. Here the cost, here the, here the budget comes for any organization. What the cost for us? And then as an Indian organization, they always go for a, a company which is a lesser, lesser uh, charge to us. And, and, and that's, that's a brutal fact. And they don't, they don't go for Cap Gemini, for example, they are charging higher to us. So it's, it's, it's not the case that uh, the right uh, after sales services, but it's more important the budget that supply chain has, the, the CFO has given to the supply chain. Because end of the day, it's our baby, it's not a CFO's baby, because we have a limited budget, and we have to you know use that budget on an effective way. That's I think just one point on yeah. this, and then probably uh, we'll, we'll come to you. Very small point, and which, which is a personal experience as well. A lot of times, it's the team's conviction also, which acts as a conduit to the management. Because it's not the management, they'll typically be overseeing the overall operation. So the con conviction and commitment with which we also go and press on a certain point or a certain vendor after having extensively evaluated, that probably you know weighs a lot more as compared to, you know in certain cases, the cost. Because what happens is if you're evaluating those best in class, they are somewhere comparable. Right, so that's, yes sir. Thank you. Uh, you brought the uh, very important point of team capability uh, with regards to adoption of technology. Uh, you know, a, a company can spend millions of dollars or whatever amount of money to get the technology in place, but uh, the adoption of technology by the team requires huge amount of cultural change. And that is where leadership will play a very, very key role because they have to ensure that the uh, you know, people are really using that technology. A very basic example, for example, if you, if, if a leadership team is having a review, uh, you know, there is an option wherein people can uh, bring in manually entered sheets, uh, you know, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you also have the capability in the tool itself which can throw out the numbers. So, you know, uh, the leadership should kind of put the foot down and say that all the reviews, everything, and the numbers would be recognized only and only if they are coming through the tool. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good point that you brought to the, uh, brought to the table, but it requires a lot of uh, uh, cultural change and uh, persistence uh, in the organization. Yeah, so Thanks. leadership leading from the front. Perfect. Yes, sir. Just 
this question and we'll probably there is a very uh, common saying in defense they say you can't select your boss you can't select your subordinate you can't select your place of work it is all provided to you and then you you have to show your leadership uh, talents and get the work done so that is how it works very interesting can, point. can, can i give you yeah, yeah. two interesting perspectives that i have first i want to come from t in terms of uh, the technology and mastering technology. Let's face it, uh, we are at a stage in life where we have to manage people who know technology rather than learn technology. Uh, therefore, our efforts should be on looking at how do I manage people who know technology well and get the best out of the technology. I don't need to know how to what, what big data is, but I need to know what the capabilities are. For example, if I were to do analytics for a, a, a group like this, I would not look at uh, Arima and stuff like that. It, it, it's no use. What we need to know is that when, how, how do I use analytics in inventory? How do I use analytics in sourcing? How do I use analytics? What are the possibilities I can have? Where do I, uh, what are the questions I ask? So one is to look at that. So there, we will end up in a stage where there will be people who will manage technology and people who will be technologists. There will be a data scientist in our team. There will be a data engineer in our team. There will be an analytics guy in our team who will do the actual number crunching, creating the algorithm. We need to manage them and give them the right. Because if you speak to a data scientist, he will talk digital. He will only talk one zero one 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 zero one one one. His thought is that. He doesn't understand the business side of it. We understand the business side of it. We don't understand the machine side of it. We therefore need to manage that side of it. One. The second perspective I have is that when we approach this term of team building, uh, Unfortunately, we will spend a million dollars, sir, to buy a piece of software, but we will not spend a small percentage of that to build people capabilities. And that is where implement, implement, SAP implementation, if it fails, is not because SAP is bad. It is because we, as a team, have not been able to do that. That realization doesn't come in very easily. And therefore, when we look at these interventions, Two things come to my mind. One, can we create a coherent set of body of knowledge needed by my organization, which will help me from move from where I am to where I want to be in four years' time or five years' time? Do we have that as a mind, as a map for us to do interventions in team building? Otherwise, we will get back into band-aid kind of a remedy. Okay, so we did a TNA analysis, the, the training need analysis said, I need to train them on this, call someone, train them on that. Then somebody else will train them on something. What we need is a coherent way forward which will map which says, these are the 10 skill sets I need to build. These 10 skill sets will be built over a period of three years, which requires a longer term engagement and a longer term commitment to the person himself. That I feel is lacking in a lot of us when we start looking at training and training need analysis. We all focus on here and now two day programs. Good. It is a band-aid. The way forward would be to look at what is my team composition five years from now? What is it that I will need them to look at five years from now? Can I build this team? The, the moment we think that the first question that the, the bean counter will ask is that, suppose he leaves. No. You can't operate on a premise which says, suppose he leaves. If you are good, you are a good employer, why should he leave? Remember, people don't leave for, they don't leave a company, they leave a boss. So if you are having people turnover, question the boss, not the people. We need to internalize this. If we show them the commitment that we have a roadmap for you, there is a technology roadmap, there is a training map where your skills will be enhanced, I think, we will be able in a far more comfortable position going forward. And that is what we need to uh, archi architect as leaders of supply chain. And that's my take on the, the, the skill building part of it. Very well said. 
So uh, I think we've had a very fairly well-rounded discussion. We've discussed the prerequisites. We've discussed the implementation use cases. What is it required from a vendor's side to qualify? So uh, on that note, I'd like to thank all the panel members. Thank you, Girish, Rituraj, and Abhishek, and the audience as well. I hand it over to you, Jason. Rituraj. Sahil. Abhishek.